photography today is at a critical historical juncture, one in which our relationship to the photographic image has changed profoundly. And conventional assumptions about photography, its veracity and uses are now being radically altered. We are constantly confronted with electronic photographic imagery that bears on the construction of our everyday experiences. Instant access to personal and public images and information, extended use of photographic images as a means of communication, increasingly sophisticated uh, techniques of photographic surveillance and supervision, and the largely invisible effect that digital images have on our social organization, and perhaps even more so on the performances of public selfhood. And yet increasingly due to artificial intelligence, or AI, users disbelieve or take for granted the functionality of widely circulated images. Just this morning, the Washington Post reported, fake images of Trump arrest show giant step for AI's disruptive powers. When I told a friend that I was working on an exhibition about photo booth portraits of black subjects from the 1930s, he immediately generated a plausible facsimile using AI software. What is disturbing about this AI image is that it is entirely fictional, invented just through punching in a few search terms. It has no content, no context, no meaning. In my own work as a photo historian and curator, I've been taking the exact opposite approach, looking at all kinds of photographs precisely for their social content, historical context, and political meaning. In other words, how can or how do photographic images make a difference in people's lives? My research recently is focused on what is called vernacular photography. So I'm going to try and tell you what that is. Uh, uh, a sprawling approach to popular photography that <clears throat> seemingly defines not only quantification, but also definition. Uh, you know, lucky for us, the Museum of Modern Art has uh, hastened to supply its own definition. Vernacular photography, MoMA says, is an umbrella term used to distinguish fine art photographs from those made by non-artists for a huge range of purposes, including commercial, scientific, forensic, governmental, and personal reasons. Snapshots capturing everyday life and subjects are a major form of vernacular photography. Uh, I'm not sure that I would agree with uh, this working definition, which sees vernacular more as a noun or a category than as an uh, adjective. Uh, I prefer to regard it more as a critical function or process, and I'll explain a little bit more about that. Snapshots. I love snapshots, uh, and I would uh, be inclined... Who is it? Ah, she went away. Any guess? No? Patty Smith. Um, I, love, I love snapshots, but I would uh, define vernacular photography this way. Vernacular photographs are personal or professional images that document and facilitate inauspicious transactions of everyday life. They are communicative and collective. They have a deliberate purpose or function for which they are shared with specific audiences. They are often anonymous, uh, and they shift creativity from the maker to the viewer or user of the photograph. They often exhibit a high degree of skill or inventiveness, but are more often prized for their use than for their inherent or overt aesthetic features. They are not generally intended to be framed or displayed as art. Vernacular photography is popular, domestic, and functional. It is the people's photography. 
In fact, by definition, the term vernacular refers to the people, to the products of the people, to what is ordinary or popular. In considering language or architecture, for example, vernacular refers to the common, the general, the unschooled, or the colloquial form of language or architecture, as opposed to the polished, high style, the urban forms, the professional. With greater attention to tradition, continuity, and adaptability than to formal experimentation, vernacular buildings or dialects often display unique creative and expressive forms, showing distinctive characteristics depending on regional tastes or local variations. This notion of the vernacular aligns with what is called low culture as opposed to high culture. It is a class distinction as well as an aesthetic one. In this regard, vernacular photography is precisely what fine art photography and its destination point, the museum, work to reject. Given the breadth of this revised methodology, one might usefully compile or examine archives of, for example, occupational tintypes, snapshots, family albums, commercial photography, studio portraits, wedding photographs, tourist slides, ethnographic studies, and prison mugshots, for example. Not to mention stereographs, tintypes, Polaroids, and penny postcards and the recent digital variations of such photography now circulating widely on the internet. One might also add to these types of two-dimensional photographs the ways that photographic images have been popularly adapted to domestic and decorative applications, uh, such as three-dimensional objects, quilts, paperweights, pillows, lampshades, frame memorials, I know some of you have collected these. Most of these, I know you have. <laughs> most, most of these vernacular images and objects were made by family members and friends, now regarded as unknown or untrained photographers, but many were also made by very skilled photographers. This guy was a professional. He had to line up all those kids to make that flag. Uh, using this definition, vernacular photography seems to describe about 99% of all photographs ever produced. The great mass of ordinary photographs, and it is clear that the most serious examinations of photography have actually carefully avoided this bedrock of photographic practice. Thus, photo historian Jeffrey Batchen uh, said recently, how can photography be restored to its very own history? <clears throat> what unites these photographs is not an aesthetic or a style, <clears throat> but a function. These images are utilitarian and purposeful. Vernacular photographs are defined by their use or purpose. They enact some kind of social or political function. Passport photographs or employee ID badges, such as you see here, are designed primarily to serve as official identification of the bearer, regardless of the aesthetic merits of their individual portraits. These are banal photographs, often recorded by the most ordinary means, by small town studio operators, by professional photographers on assignment, by dads with cameras in the backyard. They have rep record keeping or archival uses that are fundamentally non-aesthetic and tailored to specific avenues of circulation and collection, including police files, crime detection work, medical and scientific research, business reports, or even taxi licenses. Generally, the content or subject of vernacular photographs is deemed more important than the expressive nature of the image. 
If the fine art photographer strives to create something emotive and exceptional, the vernacular photographer resolutely aims to be <clears throat> as conventional as possible, to be useful, to conform to what is regarded as normal, as in school photos. <clears throat> Critical approaches to photography now discover in vernacular forms extraordinary social and historical meaning. There's even a whole book on school photos. The interest in commercial photography of all kinds, including medical, legal, and administrative forms, as well as all manner of studio portraiture, ranging from postcards to formal portraits, extends from the artistic appeal of the objects to its uses and social value. This is a counter-narrative to dominant art historical approaches. This is history from below, and increasingly critics and curators have recognized that such pictures constitute a buried strata of material forms and cultural practices that mark difference in society, and that they contribute to a wider understanding of popular culture and social history. <clears throat> This sort of reconsideration of vernacular photography, not as throwaway junk culture, but as an expressive and politically resonant document of everyday life, helps to reposition and reconceptualize the function of such artifacts and images. Dealing with the common and the quotidian, while not necessarily more democratic or laudatory, may offer new meanings to a wider range of viewers, in part because it poses direct questions about the uses of such photographs in any individual's contested daily social, political, and personal interactions. The first work that really transformed my thinking in this regard was Santu Mofakeng's Black Photo Album from 1997. Get back there. Presented as a dual slideshow, uh, Mofakeng's piece juxtaposes images of Victorian family photographs from South Africa that Mofakeng had found in his anthropological fieldwork with, on the uh, juxtaposed slide, provocative questions about their original purpose and contemporary meanings. From 1988 to 1998, Mofakeng worked as a photographer and research at the Institute for Advanced Social Research at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. <clears throat> Throughout the time he worked there, he acquired, compiled, copied, and retouched an expansive archive of studio portraits from subjects that he met in his research. These featured middle-class black sitters from 1890 to 1950, from which he created this piece, the Black Photo Album, subtitled, Look at Me. The slideshow features reproductions of vintage prints that the artist digitized and restored, and incorporates the text slides that identify the sitters, that cite speeches that present racist ideologies of the period, and that pose these provocative questions that were crafted by Mofakeng himself. For example, as you see here, Mofakeng asks, are these images evidence of mental colonization, or did they serve to challenge prevailing images of the African in the Western world? This project really made me think about how we overlook or dismiss these personal cultural objects and how their value continues to resonate as we apply new interpretations. With the Black Photo album, the artist exposes the neglected history of urban black working class individuals under colonialism and considers the aspirations of middle class Africans of the early 20th century, offering new considerations on their communities, complex identities, dynamics, and aspirations. The issues at stake in any consideration of vernacular photography are made problematic 
not only by the sheer breadth and diversity of such objects and the types of social functions that they define, but also by the shifting status and meanings of these images and objects as they move from one physical context to another or as they change meaning through time. In one setting, a particular vernacular image may be crucially valued or rich in personal associations. In another context, those same images might be considered worthless, devoid of useful content or meaning, having lost their connections. Such works require a new language, a new methodology of interpretation. As scholar Barbara Kirschenblatt Gimlet notes, no phot photograph was ever born vernacular, as the vernacular is not a fixed category or taxonomy, but a critical process of uncovering and evaluating everyday practices signified by the image. It's equally clear that the vernacular is an interpretive approach inflected by viewers' assumptions about value and hierarchy. My own understanding of vernacular photography is rooted in a theory of everyday life, one that pays attention to the banal and the overlooked, the boring and the passive, the significance of the quotidian, and the often rep repetitive micro-events showcased in commonplace everyday photography. French theorist Henri Lefebvre defined everyday life this way, in a sense residual, defined by what is left over after all distinct, superior, specialized, structured activities have been singled out by analysis, everyday life defines itself as a totality, a nothingness. In other words, everyday life is as an important lens through which individuals negotiate the essentially political micro-decisions that govern every aspect of their daily lives. Their self-representations and their resistance to or conformity to political regulations and social mores. I would draw a parallel between Lefebvre's notion of the commonality of everyday life and the ubiquitous production and distribution of vernacular photography. In this sense, Photography is not a neutral recording device, but is an active agent mediating the construction of an individual's imagined version of everyday life. It is an image that simplifies the complex and contradictory present for a future viewer. This critical ap approach is not limited to private or family photographs, but also pertains to images that are not at all private, including routine identity and surveillance photos, institutional records from prisons or mental hospitals, or ethnographic photographs and images of conquest. Central to the idea of the vernacular is the notion of sharing. An image or object that circulates within a family, neighborhood, or community that has common values. I want to focus a little bit here on the family photo album because for most of the history of photography, that has been the most familiar example of how personal images are shared. From the invention of the handheld Kodak camera in 1888, that's probably the one you have, uh, to, the, <laughs> to the widespread use of the internet for photo sharing and storage, the family photo album was a central vehicle for representing and unifying family and social identity. An album was a repository of memories and a chronicle of aspirations. It allowed makers to record, interpret, classify, and preserve their everyday experiences and rituals in love, in war, in business, and in the domestic sphere. Following the increasing availability of affordable photographic tools, along with the proliferation of print media in the early 20th century, the photo album provided an accessible format for narrating, 
commemorating and shaping everyday stories. Surviving photograph albums are often distinguished by the ingenuity and passion with which they were assembled by their makers, with surprising arrangements of photographs on the page, as well as jumbles of printed ephemera and other materials. Most photo albums demonstrate two salient characteristics. Subjects willing to pose or enact engaging spontaneous performances for snapshot images, and two, the maker's subsequent intention to physically arrange, cut, collage, and piece together images and text. The compilation of these albums signals not only an innovation in autobiographical storytelling, but also a unique facet of visual culture in which everyday images could be creatively appropriated, reassembled, and concretized into vibrant narratives. Such tactile, intimate chronicles demonstrate that vernacular photo albums derive not only from the plush Victorian portrait album, but also from the more quotidian domestic archive, the Book of Scraps. Scrapbooks began as friendship albums, incorporating notes, sketches, and signatures from communal circles, and later clippings, cards, and other ephemera. In this way, they are sim simultaneously private and public, meant to be shared with self-appointed communities. They distill a moment in time and communicate its particularities. As a domestic record of personal memories, they act as the visual and material equivalent of oral histories. At the same time, uh, these, these family photo albums are an expression of social history, often revealing specific attitudes toward the family, toward gender, towards race and the nation. This, ex this type of work um, considers uh, photographic objects and cultural artifacts perhaps forgotten or discarded by those personally connected to them uh, or their original owners, not only as treasured recollections, but as belonging to a social world. Produced within culturally specific contexts, such albums and scrapbooks bear witness to major events and prevailing social conventions, not unlike the pervasive and popular digital platforms used today. Um, the compilation of these albums signals an innovation, as I said, in autobiographical storytelling, but also a, a unique and creative aspect of visual culture. Uh, this is an album uh, by a woman who identified herself on the front cover named Sarah Hoofstetter, a young uh, girl who began this album, later uh, a woman who kept up the album over uh, approximately a decade. Um, the, uh, this is a good example of how the album became, in the 20th century, a tangible way to represent and reinforce the conventions of middle-class American life, a means to express social relations previously deemed unimportant or ephemeral, but now as central to Midwestern American culture. Uh, this woman, Sarah Hoofstetter, was born in 1888, she began this album in 1908, when she was 20 years old, and continued uh, for the next eight or nine years till 1916 or 17. Her family owned a reasonably prosperous cigar and candy store in Columbus, Ohio, where Sarah lived with her family, worked as a bookkeeper, and never married. Her album carefully records family outings to nearby Buckeye Lake, but also to more distant destinations such as Washington, D.C. and Niagara Falls. Of course, what we see is her album is distinguished by 
an extraordinary array of strangely shaped photographs printed using special masks showing family and friends in various informal portrait poses and engaged in various sporting activities. Whether these photographs were printed commercially or perhaps by Sarah herself is unknown, but they do reflect uh, a momentary interest in designing and enlivening family photo photograph albums uh, as part of the extraordinary uh, domestic ritual of viewing these albums. Hoofstadter died in Columbus, Ohio, in her family home in 1988, just a few months short of her 100th birthday. A far cry from that carefully constructed chronology of Columbus, Ohio, is the hodgepodge collage approach to personal depictions evident in many other types of albums. Uh, this page from a small, rough, uh, black American album from around 1935 illustrates this more impressionistic composition. But interestingly, it combines portraits of individuals, many photo booth images, with printed captions clipped from magazines or newspapers. For instance, one outdoor shot of a picnic or gathering is captioned, Forgotten Faces. Other cut out adjectives or ambiguous phrases such as manhood or charming or small town girl are applied to various friends or romantic interests. Other pairings are quite jarring such as a smiling young woman labeled a lonesome kid or a young woman staring off to the side and wearing her hat tilted uh, at a playful angle who is labeled simply discouraged. There is in this humble album a lively exchange filled with innuendo between the labels and the subjects, all young and stylish African Americans. An even more elaborate version of this type of collaged autobiography is the scrapbook and photo album arranged over several years by Richard Hicks Bowman, who served in the US Air Force during World War II stationed in what is today Western New Guinea and the South Philippines. Bowman compiled this album in the 1950s from artifacts that span over a decade. The album chronicles Bowman's war service, his discharge in 1946, and his vagabond life in New Orleans in the post-war years. His personal archive contains photographs, receipts, uh, insurance cards and other printed ephemera often collage together extraordinarily again with postage stamps and printed captions and his scrapbooking style is lively and inventive often using f words or phrases clipped from magazines and newspapers to comment on pictures of himself or others particularly his lady friends my aching back um, and uh, there's, there's uh, 50 page spreads of this. It goes on and on. It's an extraordinary album. Uh, but through, through these captions and handwritten notes, Bowman weaves a narrative about his love life, my forbidden past, his war buddies, many of whom were killed, as you can see on the uh, facing page, uh, and much of the commentary concerns his uh, experiences as a black soldier and several news clippings refer specifically to the racist treatment of African Americans in the service during the war. Bowman celebrates the visit of boxer Joe Lewis and actress Hattie McDaniel and he refers to dark-skinned Pacific Islanders as my people and my brothers. So uh, even in something as straightforward as a family album, uh, the makers were often making a, an overt or explicit political statement. Family snapshots, family albums rarely convey the anxieties of domestic gender identity, 
preferring instead to replicate and record the enactment of social roles proscribed by convention. These personal documents of the successful performance of ritual social obligations reinforce the acceptance and perpetuation of heteronormative gender positions. But vernacular photographs are often disruptive and are generally ambiguous, some deliberately so, in order to evade censorship or exposure or to establish bonds of subcultural community. For example, the photographs from this diminutive photo album created by four young women on an outing in the countryside remains inscrutable. The women at first wear clothing as they stroll through the countryside. <clears throat> Ultimately, each in turn removes her shirt and poses for typological snapshots of her back, hands, and feet. These highly personal vernacular photographs show private and somewhat unexpected versions of gender representation and sexuality, perhaps suggesting queer intimacy. In fact, it is the not knowing, the not naming, that makes the album so appealing. In fact, I would uh, draw your attention to a project by uh, photo historian David Deacher called Dear Friends, in which he singled out uh, historical photographs of men together and proposed that they appealed to him because of his own queer identity. And he sought to see those relationships in these images. Uh, the book was somewhat controversial at the time because a lot of people said, where's the evidence? What do you know about these people? Uh, and my point would be, uh, it's exactly that ambiguity that allows for these imaginative interpretations of the image uh, uh, by a contemporary reader. The meaning and original use or intention of such images <clears throat> remains obscure or ambiguous, as with the girls in the countryside. Any contemporary interpretation of the sexual relationships, filial comradeship, or social relations depicted in these representations relies on the responses of the viewer, not the maker, and not even the subjects and what they propose to show in their pictures. This is a kind of newly subjective methodology uh, that critic Stuart Hall called the politics of reading. Taking advantage of your political position in interpreting pictures uh, in ways that you find uh, particularly useful. In extending Stuart Hall's politics of reading to a more activist intervention in uh, historical representations and community building, artists and contemporary art photographers have often been the most inventive and critically engaging, just as the example of Santu Mofagang that I spoke about in the beginning. Uh, the mainly historical collections that these artists and photographers look at display two characteristics that might be regarded as crucial to our networked 21st century moment. First, a desire and a capacity to capture and record the often overlooked or disregarded minutia of everyday life. And two, the tools, often digital tools, necessary to collate and organize the overwhelming volume of images and information that results. Artists such as Lorna Simpson, Wendy Redstar, Jason Lazarus, Eric Kessels, Patrick Pound, Iris Wu, and many others have seized upon the opportunity to compile and preserve and play with vernacular archives designed to function politically by highlighting specific social issues or marginalized communities. These vernacular artist archivists distill meaning from their uh, reorganized detritus through the conceptual processes of taxonomic classification, serial repetition, progressive sequences, or the sheer accumulation of new archives. 
These artists use the emotional appeal of everyday objects, not nostalgically, but strategically, as a way to provide a bulwark against trauma and loss, and all that is ephemeral. So I want to talk about a few artists who have done projects of this sort with what I'm now calling vernacular images. At the Gulu Real Art Studio in Gulu, Uganda, photographer Opal Denis made ID pictures for local people seeking work by cutting the client's face out of a full-length portrait and discarding the remainder of the print. The identity portraits uh, were crucial for the citizens of Gulu, where more than half the population had been displaced by an ongoing war. For these identity photos, the intent was that one individual's image could be compared to another for identification within a state or corporate organization. To establish, the goal was to establish discernible physiognomic differences within a uniform format, typical identification photograph. The character or personality of the sitter, the hallmark of the bourgeois portrait, was irrelevant to these ID photos. And yet, sitter, the sitters, as you can see, they came decked out in all kinds of fancy regalia, uh, ready to have their portrait made sometimes proudly asserting their relative standings within the social structure and the community, positions that were ratified or confirmed by its documentation in identification photography. In January 2011, uh, documentary photographer, actually war photography, Martina Bacigalupo, uh, who was based in East Africa, began to collect Denny's thrown away faceless images, literally digging through his garbage can. Uh, she thought they were kind of cool, uh, even though they had no faces. Uh, even without their portraits, they represent nurses, soldiers, farmers, teachers, businessmen, students, mothers, children, the young and the old. You see once you look at dozens of these, it's a real cross-section of Gulu society. These portraits follow in the, traditional, uh, in the tradition of vernacular studio photography in East Africa. However, devoid of their faces, they're completely unlike conventional studio portraits. Distinctions are established through pose, clothing, and self-definition, or in recurring motifs such as the blue jacket required for certain bank applications. The cutouts heighten attention to gesture and detail while the uniformity of the background provides a comparative study of a society during a specific moment of economic and political transition. Uh, the next artist who I want to say a few words about uh, is Edessa Hendless, a Canadian uh, gallery owner, artist, and, well, collector of teddy bear, teddy bear photographs, vernacular photography extraordinaire. Nowhere is this predilection for creating meaning from chaos more apparent than in the, the exhibition created by Canadian artist Edessa Hendless called Partners, or the Teddy Bear Project in 2002. In my estimation, one of the most significant creative expressions of the last two decades. If computers have granted immaterial, immateriality to images, they have also provided the precise network for photographs to recirculate as artifacts, as images, as potential archives. And Hendless, using eBay and other online sources, was able 
to amass over a few years an archive of over 3,000 vernacular photographs, each one including the image of a teddy bear, the ultimate comforter. These once beloved, now discarded photographs, and she wondered why they were discarded. How could such beloved images be discarded? Uh, so she retrieved them, and each was neatly mounted and framed, arranged in meticulous subcategories and taxonomies, and then hung in this dizzying salon-style installation with massive wooden cabinets and a mezzanine level accessible by a spiral staircase. Unlike an array of arrowheads or African masks displayed for the didactic purpose of comparing and contrasting data, Hendelis says, the teddy bear project takes vernacular, mundane, family album photographs and makes them into a project with meaning that is metaphorical. Among other things, this overwhelming exhibition makes the point that while all museums are predicated on the desperate urge to preserve the past as it disappears around us, what is most endangered is often that which is most common and most personal, particularly in an era dominated by social media platforms that re recklessly trivialize and commodify our most intimate emotional selves. Another artist that I'd like to mention uh, is William Camargo, who was a 2022 Woodstock Air artist in residence for the Center for Photography at Woodstock. This uh, Camargo is an arts educator and a photo-based artist and arts advocate uh, born and raised in Anaheim, California and currently he serves as Commissioner of Heritage and Culture for the city of Anaheim. He's also the founder and curator of the Latinx Diaspora Archive, uh, an Instagram page and uh, extensive archive that elevates communities of color through pulling together archives of Latinx family photographs. Um, Camargo says, and here's some examples. Camargo says, uh, the project I've started uh, is about reuniting communities of color, those specifically of the Latinx diaspora. While this is a huge task for anyone to undertake, many others have succeeded. Other non-traditional archivists, and he cites several of them by their Instagram handles, uh, and many more accounts are part of the archive as activism movement. So this is seizing on vernacular photographs as they circulate on the internet and building them into archives that have new meanings. It is an attempt to question the institution of the archive, to ask who holds the majority of archives of black folks, of queer folks, of Latinx communities and other marginalized groups, who has access to them? How are they displayed? Uh, Camargo says, coming from a low-income background, an attempt to look at the archives that he wanted to visit posed difficulties, so he made his own. It aims to center family photos of the Latinx diaspora through an Instagram account to make them available internationally for free. He considers himself a non-traditional archivist, uh, and each, each image is scanned, uh, available on the internet, and the original returned to the family. So it's not about preservation of the originals, it's not about fetishizing the object, it's really about creating an online community through images that would otherwise be lost, or, or at least invisible. Uh, and the last project I want to talk about uh, is an exhibition at the Center for Photography at Woodstock. 
uh, called Black Photo Booth from the collections of Naki Gorinan and Oliver Wasso. Uh, Naki Gorinan and Oliver Wasso are two visual artists uh, who have very successful careers as artists, but they're also scholars of American portraiture. Uh, Naki Gornan is the author of a book called American Photo Booth, uh, and Oliver Wasso is the author of two books uh, on vernacular portraiture. Uh, they both happen to have extensive collections of black photo booth pictures. Uh, images that, as you saw in some of the early albums, were often cast aside, discarded, uh, unrecognized. The introduction of the photo booth in the late 1920s, uh, I would say, marked a watershed moment in American culture, and certainly for uh, vernacular photography. For the first time, folks from all walks of life could have their portrait taken quickly, conveniently, and inexpensively. I wouldn't say that this was necessarily democratization of photography, but at least provided a, a point of access. Inaugurated by Anatole Josefo in New York in 1925, the photo booth was a studio, darkroom, and photo delivery service all rolled into one tiny booth without a photographer. And this is interesting. You didn't have to go pose for a photographer in his studio. You could step into the booth, which was relatively private uh, and available in drugstores, bus stations, and county fairs. And for a quarter, some of you may remember, uh, the machine would uh, snap your picture while you made silly faces and deliver a strip of direct positive prints within a matter of minutes. The modest vernacular portraits produced by the thousands in photo booths across the country com comprise a rich record of visual representation and social history. During the decades after the Great Depression, black Americans in particular made extensive use of the widely uh, accessible photo booths for self-representation. Many of the intimate portraits made there featured distinctive fashions or hairstyles, while others clearly document celebratory outings. The privacy of the photo booth provided an opportunity for spontaneity and freedom, uh, for self-portraiture and self-representation. Uh, this exhibition, Black Photo Booth, captures casual interactions of everyday life, farmers in Coveralls, women wearing their best Easter hats, revelers drinking, lovers kissing. The photographs range from small strips uh, or single images to larger arcade photos, uh, often featuring folky hand-painted backdrops. These small portraits were sentimental keepsakes, once gathered in frames and family albums now in circulation as vernacular photographs. And uh, of course, you're all invited tomorrow to our opening, 5.30 to 7.30. Uh, in conclusion, um, as records and tools of everyday life, vernacular photographs were once embedded in social narratives and functions, from the highly personal family album to the bureaucratic identity photograph now radically decontextualized from their original communities and uses, these orphaned photographs are symbols or uh, synecdoches of the often violent cultural displacements that set them adrift and resulted in their abandonment. In reassigning or replacing the original cultural value do museums, collectors, and scholars perpetuate and reproduce patterns of past cultural pillaging? What responsibilities do we have to intervene in this traffic in photograph? And how can we reconnect these orphaned artifacts to the stories, histories, and communities 
from which they have been divided. In a short text on this very subject, Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist Orhan Pamuk, himself the propriety of an idiosyncratic vernacular museum in Istanbul that uses commonplace objects to weave a story of love, longing, and loss, as he says, offers his view on the appropriate critical approach to such personal connections, to such personal collections. We don't need more museums that try to construct historical narratives of a society, community, team, nation, state, tribe, company, or species. We all know that the ordinary, everyday stories of individuals are richer, more humane, and much more joyful. Thank you. Answer questions, discuss further. So what is the role of uh, changing. <laughs> changing every day. Uh, we need people to invent new museums uh, that are more responsive to their communities uh, rather than, as Pamuk says, weaving grand historical narratives uh, and appropriating um, cultures from other nations and people. So uh, I think what's happened over the last decade certainly has been a real rethinking of the role of the museum. As you've seen, museums repatriating objects, rethinking their leadership, rethinking their corporate sponsorship, uh, and, and really reevaluating uh, their, um, you know, their, their basic mission and, and purpose and history. Uh, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, and uh, it's, I say this at the end because uh, it is, it's analogous to what I'm talking about with photography, uh, which has a history of very uh, rather narrow in retrospect and conventionalized history and museums also function in a very conventionalized way, uh, and they replicate the structures and ideologies of the culture around them rather than challenging a lot of those views, which they could potentially do with uh, historical artifacts and images, as they're doing right here at the DNH Museum. Yes. Yes. Almost everything that you showed us as an example of vernacular photography involves images of people. Mm -hmm. um, but it seems to me that there's a whole class of what I would call I mean, non-professional mm -hmm. photography that, let's say, travel yep. photography. I mean, that's, I think, a lot of what's on the, um, you know, the media, social media pyramids or you know, a street in Paris or whatever that yep. what so do you consider those vernacular or yeah uh, as as I was trying to say I think um, it's not a category that's about you know drawing boundaries or establishing exclusivity of subject matter but it's really a critical methodology, a way of looking at pictures, and certainly uh, I think travel or tourist photography or, you know, on the internet, cat photos or uh, food photos, those certainly qualify as vernacular forms. Uh, I mean, what we're talking about really is just popular usages of lens-based media. Um, and you know, you can, uh, you can broaden the definition of photography as much as you want, uh, and I would say as broad as possible. Let's think about all the types of photographs that are out there, and my questions would be, how do they circulate? What is the relationship between the makers, the subjects, and the viewers, and how do they relate to uh, 
existing or existing communities or communities in formation. So one of the things that struck me was you, talk, you were talking about early photography and you were distinguishing um, photography that was done for museums. But as far as I know, most of those early photographs Right. Would that's correct. Last 50 years. Right. So, what do you consider them for national? Um, I'm I mean, talking. Like Julia Marker Cameron. Yeah. Like, yep. That, those pictures of yep. girls. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, if we're if we're talking about, for example. Uh, amateur photography in England in the 1860s. This was a, an aristocratic project. It was not something that was accessible to uh, people in all strata of society to either make pictures or have their picture made, right? And so Julia Margaret Cameron's a really interesting example of somebody who was a, an aristocratic amateur who uh, was highly skilled and extremely intelligent and uh, made beautiful photographs. Uh, you know, I would, I, you could probably make an argument that those were, uh, that those had some vernacular application in that uh, she wasn't necessarily making photographs to be displayed at the National Portrait Gallery, although she did do that, uh, a lot of her photographs were of family members, right? And she made albums that she presented to members of the family uh, with these highly sophisticated photographs. So those, you know, could be considered high-end vernacular photographs. Uh, it's really just uh, more about um, how things are used rather than fitting into a particular category and, uh, and uh, the general statement I would make is that the category of fine art photography tends to shut down some of those arguments and um, preclude uh, that critical investigation on the assumption that the um, knowledge about the excellence of certain practitioners and the status of the canon of artists and photographers is known in, adv in advance and, and the requirements to participate in that classification uh, are settled business, right? And I'm saying, you know, let's look at all the other photographs that are made and what do they do, right? Yeah. Can you give us any advice as to what we should do with those boxes of Yep. Or where they were. What do you do with them? Yep. Because uh, <laughs> we brought them with us. <laughs> a friend of mine said, I never met a photograph I didn't like. Uh, so I'm, I'm not sure I'd be quite that open minded. But yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, practically speaking, I would make a distinction between what one does as a researcher, critic, or scholar, and what one does uh, as a practical um, housekeeper. Um, having, set, having thrown away a few photographs in my life, I, I would say you can't save them all. Uh, but I would say that each of them does have a history and, and a story, right? And if you want to unlock those stories, they're there to be investigated. Go for it. That is, that is my wife speaking. Oh. And you wouldn't believe the number of photographs that we have. What have I, what have I started? Uh, well, you could have a little um, photograph gallery here. I'd be happy to come over and advise. Yes. Um, I'm curious what you think or if you have any predictions about what the, you know, a decade ago the iPhone became ubiquitous and we now all have these incredible 
treasure troves of ordinary daily life photography. Yeah. What happens as those of us who have had lifelong records in their phones start to pass and no longer are there boxes, but now it's digital record. Yeah, no, it's the what same. I think that might do or how people might use these records of our lives and how that might affect yeah. photography. Wouldn't that be interesting? That would be a great museum of like, you know, hundreds of uh, cell phone downloads of people's personal photographs. Yeah. It would be amazing. I mean, uh, one of the points is that a lot of times these vernacular photographs mean more in the aggregate than they do individually. And, um, and interestingly, to make the point about uh, fine art photography uh, as typically seen in museums, most of those museum exhibitions focus on individual photographs, one after another. Uh, I think what's typical of vernacular photographs is you have to get a mass of them together and you see, you know, serial conventions, or you see uh, relationships between elements within uh, a series. Um, and yes, uh, I would love to see uh, anyone's download of their uh, digital files because I think it would be fascinating. What do people look at? What do they pay attention to? Now that you, that everyone has the capacity to take pictures all the time, you know, what do you do with that? Opportunity. Grandkids will sit there and flip through our lives. Who knows? Who knows where it'll be then? <laughs> yes, man in the back row. <laughs> um, I always heard that Andy Warhol said, um, "It's art if you call it art," and I wonder if the the opposite in a way would be is that is the vernacular if you don't. Call because, you know, you think about, I mean, I'm very familiar with vernacular, but this incredible kind of you can't get to it unless you don't say it's there sort of thing. You know, it's this incredible, I don't even... Don't you can't know. get to what? Well, the idea of, because artists on the whole love the vernacular. But Why is that? Well, that's a really good question. I think in part because there's, if I can dare to say it, there's sort of almost a purity I'm just curious the relationship between people that call it art and then people that no no this isn't art this is function or all of the you know yeah 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 well that's really uh, a, a variant on the same question we've been talking about like how do you establish those categories or boundaries what are the rules what are the criteria and I'm as you can tell, sort of suggesting let's eliminate a lot of those categories or, as you suggest, you know, call the Warhol paintings a vernacular of sort. They're representative of a particular uh, mindset about image making in the 1960s and 70s in a very specific geographic location, a very specific culture, uh, and that has vernacular ramifications which is interesting. Well, wouldn't you say that someone like Warhol is intentionally creating art? It's not just like, oh, all of a sudden I'm making a Campbell soup can, you know? It, this is all with very focused intention. And isn't that the difference between that and vernacular or that well, outsider art? Uh, Warhol's a good example because he specifically seized upon vernacular images and objects in order to make a shocking transformation of them yeah, into it's, it's something. Intentional. Yeah. Whereas all these other little, oh, let's go in photo booth. Nobody's there to make a piece of art. Right. Unless they happen to be artists who right. are getting in the, in the booth and deciding we're going to do a little project. Right. So that's what I would think. There was no intention to make art from these things. Right. Well, that's why I was trying to suggest that moving away, the, the uh, photo booth uh, images are interesting because there's no intent of a photographer because there's no photographer. There's an intent of the sitter. There's maybe an intent of the viewer. 
And so you have these overlays of interpretation from uh, sources that are somewhat unexpected because we're used to applying the intentionality to the maker of the image, right? And so, no, people were not going into the photo booth to make art for the most part. They were going into the photo booth for a sentimental keepsake, having some fun, uh, and uh, that's interesting. That's, 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 that's a positive movement. Yes? I don't know if I can frame this um, um, exactly the way I'm thinking, but I, I'm sure you're familiar with um, Seabald's um, books and uh, Austerlitz and the way he incorporates in, in, in terms of these thrown away images that he's found in garbage cans and flea markets and then he's writing these um, uh, historical fiction narratives that seem autobiographical. The first book I read, I kept looking for the photo credits in the back and then I was shocked by that. Oh no, so he's weaving his own an, another story, another, making another history with someone else's or another um, body of work or of um, um, finagler. Yeah. I mean, I, I found that fascinating. Yeah, no, exceptional. And uh, that, that would be another, that could have been another example of how artists use found photographs instead of this more sort of didactic archives or you know extravagant museum installations um, using uh, anonymous or found imagery as a creative inspiration or even as a uh, historical fiction of sorts good point anything else all right well thank you all for coming this is Thank you.